This is where I'd really love to be able to use like special effects to make like magic shoot out of my hands or something like that. But um, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. And even if I did, I don't think I have the the actual programs to be able to do it on my computer either. So suspend your disbelief and just imagine it. Hello, today I want to talk about the voluntary suspension of disbelief, what it is and sort of how that doesn't always necessarily work out the way we want it to. So what is it? Well it's something my mum told me about when I was a teenager. Um, and it is, if we break it down word by word, a voluntary suspension of disbelief is voluntary, you opt in, uh, suspension, as in you put on pause, and disbelief, meaning not believing in something. So, like, essentially the voluntary suspension of disbelief is that you buy into the concept. You read in a fantasy novel, you just ignore the fact that you know that magic doesn't exist. You read in a sci-fi novel, you just accept the aliens and the technology and whatever as it stands, regardless of whether that's any kind of, has any kind of bearing on the reality of the situation, any kind of links to real science or real, real aliens. <laughs> and that is what the voluntary suspension of disbelief is. But it's not just that, to me at least, as an author. To me as an author, it feels more like a contract between the reader and the author, where the reader agrees that they will voluntarily suspend their disbelief and the author's job is to make it as easy as possible to do so. So, when you think of it like a contract, it makes it easier to see why these things can break down, whereas if you just see it as something that a reader does, it kind of just ends up being a, well it's all on them if they didn't like it, rather than being something that can be portioned out and explained into the possibility of everybody moving forward with a better grasp of what they like and how to do things kind of well. Well is in bunny ears because everybody obviously has a different opinion of what doing things well looks like, but here we go. So the contract between the author and the reader is that the reader will voluntarily suspend their disbelief and that the author will make it easy for them to do so. So one of the ways that the contract can break down is just a mismatch between the reader and the author. There's nothing wrong by either party. It's a good book, it's convincing, it's internally consistent. We'll get into all of the ways you make it convincing later. Um, but it's just, it just doesn't meet the reader's needs. And it's not, it's again, it's not anybody's fault that it doesn't meet the reader's needs, like the reader thought it was going to meet their needs, the author has written a good book, but it's just not that the right book for the reader. It's like a shoe that doesn't fit. It's just not, it's not right. And like, it's the thing of like, when it's in the right genre and on the right shelf and all that jazz, it's like the shoe that you put on and it fits your foot in it, it's just incredibly uncomfortable to wear. An example, perchance? Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse, my book, um, <laughs> is a, a fantasy novel. It is high fantasy, it's epic fantasy, it is, it's set in a completely fantastical world, it's got magic in it, it's got all that kind of stuff. It is however in an urban setting, it is set in a city, the city of Shima, on the island of Shima, because I get to make the rules and also because that does happen a lot in real world. Anyway, um, it's set in a world called Terrier. T-E-R-Y-A, Terrier. Um, not like Terrier, like the dog. Um, didn't think of that when I wrote it down. I only thought of that after I started pronouncing it and I'd already printed my postcards by that point, so. Postcard maps. Anyway. Set in the city of Shima on the island of Shima. It would, however, probably be shelved near Lord of the Rings, especially because it's Salisbury McGregor and Tolkien, so S and T, although there's probably a lot of books in between them, but that's not the point. The point is that it would probably be shelved somewhere near Lord of the Rings because they're the same kind of genre and we have similar surnames, well not similar surnames, but like close enough, but surnames. 
it's nothing like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> like if you're buying and looking at Mary Allen Breaking the Curse, looking for Lord of the Rings, I hate to break it to you, but you picked the wrong book. I mean, even just look at the spine width on this. This is about 100 pages of 100. This is about 300 pages of book. It's, it's not Lord of the Rings. Um, it's a low description. It's like things are described, but not in exhaustive amounts of detail. There is an assumption with Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse that you will be able to to fill in the rest of the details yourself, or that it won't bother you that you can't fill in the rest of the details yourself. And that's one of the beautiful things about spine width is that it will tell you if that kind of thing is is likely. Like the bigger, thicker a book is, the more likely it is to have more description. The thinner a book is, the less likely it is to have lots of description. Like, this is how we lose the time war, for example, is uh, a book that I really love, but <laughs> is a very, very thin, I can't remember if it's a novella or a no novelette, but it's one of those. It's not quite a novel because it's not quite long enough. And in that situation, you don't expect a lot of description and you don't get a lot of description until poignant moments where you really need to understand. And it's sort of similar to that in this, um, description wise. Um, when, oh, look, I have a postcard here. Anyway, um, when it comes to Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse, you get introduced to, if you haven't seen my description video, it's basically like that. You get about three sentences for every place and person you meet. Um, <laughs> it does not have any fantasy languages in it. Or rather, it does, but they're not conglangs. They're not described in any way. It's literally just people talk about languages the way that you talk about languages in real life. So, like, people say things like, oh, I'm more familiar with French. Or, um, oh, well, French is my mother tongue, so, like, that's what I speak best. Just to be clear, I don't speak very good French. Um, <laughs> Elven, or Goblin, or Dragonborn, or Human. And then we have dialects that, again, are vaguely referenced, but not really talked about in any detail. It's not like my sci-fi novel, where I do actually have most of a conline built. Um, <laughs> but it's one that you wouldn't actually be able to use. Right? That's not important. The point is that if you we're expecting conlang, and if you were expecting massive amounts of description, and if you were expecting the nomenclature of every tree, you wouldn't get it. And you'd be disappointed, and you might have a mismatch. If you're the kind of person who needs everything described so that they can actively see what's happening in the environment around them, this wouldn't be the book for you. In the same way that I really struggle to try and get through Lord of the Rings, because there's just too much description. It feels to me very bloated and very hard to get through and I've never finished it because of that because I don't like a lot of description which is why I don't write a lot of description it's not that there's anything better or worse about having a high or low description book it's just that some people like one and some people like the other I feel like I've talked for a long time to get to the end of that point but oh well um, <laughs> the second way that the voluntary suspension of disbelief contract can break down is when the book is objectively bad. Objectively bad can mean a lot of different things, so let's really clarify what exactly I mean here. Objectively bad, to me in this instance, is primarily it's shelved in the wrong place. It's shelved in fantasy when it should be in sci-fi. It's shelved in romance when it should not be because it's not a happy ending. Um, <laughs> it's shelved in contemporary when it's an alternate reality. It's shelved in contemporary when it's an urban fantasy. It doesn't have the right cover. Like there was a book that I bought a while ago. Um, I can't remember which book it was and I wouldn't name and shame anyway. But there was a book that I bought a little while ago that looked like a fantasy book. The cover screamed fantasy book. The title screamed fantasy book. The description on the back screamed fantasy book. Even the prologue was very fantastical. And then you get into the actual book itself and it's a sci-fi. Bearing in mind that I like both fantasy and sci-fi, I did not like this book because it's missold itself. Couldn't suspend my disbelief, I would opted in for a fantasy universe, and I ended up with the sci-fi one. I was confused, I was disorientated, and I didn't like it. <laughs> but there's also the internal consistency part, the stuff that the author, every author, has a little more control over, compared to like the shelving and cover and all that jazz. 
tends to be a publisher's domain and if you are not an independent or self-publishing author you don't have a whole lot of control over it. But when it comes to the interior of the book, the content of the book, that is much more the author's domain regardless of how they're getting themselves published. So internal consistency and a logical narrative and avoiding things like deus ex machina. Now most of the time when it comes to deciphering writing advice, a series I have on this channel if you haven't seen it, where I talk about what different pieces of writing advice mean and how you can take them and how you can break them, um, but <laughs> deus ex machina, like most of the time I'll sort of talk about in that series how you can decide how much of a certain piece of writing advice you want to use. Like for example with the passive voice, you get to decide how much passive voice you want to include and how much you want to, to edit out. And there's nothing wrong with deciding to maintain the passive voice, there are purposes and uses for it, that's part of why it exists. Um, however with deus ex machina, I, I have to say, I don't think there is ever really a reason to have it. I don't think it's ever very valuable in a story. And obviously, again, that is just my personal opinion, but if you don't know what deus ex machina is, it translates from Latin to an act of God or by act of God. I can never remember if it's an or by. Um, but basically what it means is a, a usually a solution to a problem that is not in any way baked into the narrative beforehand. Um, so there's a book that came out relatively recently, and it was a TikTok sensation book. It was hyped up massively on TikTok before it even got released. Um, and as we found out later, uh, primarily by paid ads, but anyway, <laughs> um, so it was all hyped up on TikTok and um, and then it was published and people read it because it had been so hyped up and it was such a, a big, big, big phenomenon and then people really, really didn't like it and I read a review of that and that's what triggered the whole thought process for this video. Um, but basically, the problem with that was that the internal consistency was just all over the place. It didn't have any internal consistency. There was, and you're probably going to be able to figure it out based on what I say next, but, um, and bearing in mind that I've only read the review, I haven't read the book. And again, I'm not naming and shaming, so don't guess. <laughs> like, you can guess to yourself, but don't like throw in your comments, I think it's this book by this person, because we don't name and shame here, we elevate and celebrate. <laughs> but anyway, so this book had things like it had a prophecy and prophecy novel prophecy stories are really hard to write like i was writing children of prophecy a series of short stories on nipples.wordpress.com and i had a real hard time of it and i ended up pausing that until next year partially because i was trying to do NaNoWriMo failed that uh partially because <laughs> i had a lot of publishing stuff to get done like the sequel for mary Ellen breaking the curse comes out in march next year and pre-orders open on tuesday um like <laughs> I am doing a cover reveal and pre-orders and all that jazz on Tuesday. I had to get a lot of stuff done. Um, and yeah, so like I just, I didn't have time, the time I needed to dedicate to that. And maybe I'll come back to it and maybe I won't. There's other abandoned stories on nobrudles.wordpress.com. That's just one of the things you have to deal with over there. Um, if you want a series that I did actually finish, Sage and Leo's Recompense is one, but that's not the point. The point is I have tried to write a prophecy story it's real hard to do because you either need to write the whole story and then write the prophecy around it or write the prophecy first and then actually maintain the story based on the prophecy and this author didn't do either of those things the prophecy didn't make sense now prophecies tend to be one of those things where they're very divisive but prophecies tend to be one of those things where you have to voluntarily suspend your disbelief for the prophecy the prophecy is the thing that you are it's the flux capacitor of the novel. Can I flip this, is that this version of this video? Um, it's the thing that you put in nice and early on to tell your readers that this is, this is a universe in which these kinds of things, these kinds of flux capacitors, these kinds of prophecies exist. And if you don't like that, that's fine. But you might want to head out because there's going to be a thing here. So that's a big thing with prophecies and then you really have to very solidly adhere yourself to the prophecy or fully break the prophecy. Those are the options when it comes to prophecies. And this book didn't do either of those things, it tried to adhere to it but the prophecy was very garbled and the way that it was translated into the reality of the situation didn't make any sense and didn't make sense 
for the characters to have figured out that that was the solution because why would it? <laughs> because there was no connection between those two things and that's a very deus ex machina kind of thing where you just as the author put the solution in and hope that your readers will fill in the blanks there are ways where you can let your readers fill in the blanks that is not one of them you have to explain a prophecy so another one of the things that this novel that I'm not naming and shaming did according to this review was that there was a long time storm that happened around the location that everything in the plot took place in and then between those in the brief inter interludes when the storm didn't happen people came to the island, it's an island um, to do the plot basically but there's no infrastructure for a storm there and if you live in a place with a lot of storms that's obviously going to break your voluntary suspension of disbelief because if you live in a place with lots of storms you know that the the whole area is set up for those kinds of storms to happen. I used to live in Wellington, New Zealand, uh, Aotearoa, and <laughs> let me tell you, that place is set up for every kind of thing that can happen there. It is set up to deal with the, the winds and the storms. It is set up to deal with all of the things that you expect to happen in Wellington. by the shape of the buildings, by the style they're made out of. You know that in places that are prone to earthquakes, a lot of the time they have buildings that are specifically designed to wobble during an earthquake rather than shatter. And like, these are the kind of things that are built into Wellington because earthquakes do happen in Wellington. One of them happened while we were there. It was wild because I've never experienced that before, but my wife has because she used to live in Cyprus and there were earthquakes there. Or possibly when she was going somewhere else, I don't know. She's lived through earthquakes before, it's a thing that's happened and she was just there like, yeah, it's an earthquake, it's fine. It's, it's not even moving the stuff, it's just moving us. And I was like, I feel incredibly dizzy, what's happening? She's like, no, it's just an earthquake. And I was like, just, because um, I had never experienced it before. It was wild. But when you've lived in a place like that and you know that it's set up for these kinds of eventualities, when you read in a book that's got a big storm and none of the infrastructure of the place that the storm is in is apparently set up for a storm or affected by the storm, it's kind of voluntary suspension of disbelief breaking. I imagine it's not so bad if you don't know that, if you've never lived in a place like, if you were born and raised in the UK, for example, it's not prepared for anything. I mean, apart from sort of the <laughs> winters being cold, it's not really prepared for anything because nothing ever happens. Like, it rarely snows, the infrastructure's not there for snow. It's rarely warm, the infrastructure's not there for warm. It's, it rarely has, I'd say rarely has floods. Floods are becoming more common, unfortunately. Eh, climate crisis. Um, <laughs> also, as are snows and absurd heat. But, you know, that's not the point. The point is that the infrastructure isn't built in for these kinds of eventualities because we're not expecting them. And that's kind of normal. Um, so I imagine if you were born and raised in the UK, you you would expect, you wouldn't expect that kind of infrastructure to be there because it, it isn't in the UK. But for people who live in places with a lot of storms or a lot of other natural oh, disasters, is the best word I can think of, um, you're expecting the infrastructure to be there and when it's not, it is disbelief breaking. And these are all the little things that once you've hooked yourself on one thread by accident, it starts to unravel the tapestry. So if the prophecy bothered you, and the fact that the prophecy doesn't work out neatly bothers you, you'll start as a reader to see all of these other flaws. Once that voluntary suspension of disbelief is plucked at and stretched thin, it can take very little to break it. So like with this one review of this novel that again I'm not naming, the lack of infrastructure for storms really really bothered this person and then the prophecy didn't make sense and from there everything snowballed into this massive review that took a really long time to read but it was fascinating um, of all of the things that they didn't like about this novel because of these two pinch points and that's the kind of thing that happens if you have poor internal consistency 
and deus ex machina and don't fulfill the promises you make to the reader and that's something I will be talking about in another video at some point is the promise you make to your reader on page one. This is a piece of writing advice that I've heard before. Obviously that's the author's job to solve because they are the one who's kind of in charge of the internal consistency. Again, when you come to like traditional publishing, there's a lot more, there's a lot less control for the author than there is in, in indie and self-publishing and like small house publishing, just because of the way that the publishing business and publishing industry is set up. Um, make of that what you will. Um, I'm not putting a judgement out about it either way, it's just, I'm just sharing. Um, so the third way that the contract between the reader and the author, a voluntary suspension of disbelief, convincing narrative, can break down is bad faith criticism. Bad faith criticism, bad faith criticism is when a reader doesn't really want to buy in. So this is very much, I'm going to use uh, another example of a uh, young adult novel, I swear, I don't know why I keep using young adult novels, I don't read young adult novels, I don't write young adult novels, like I read them when I was a young adult, but it's been a long time since then. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, this happens a lot with things like young adult novels, or when um, women's fiction, I hate that title, but women's fiction makes it big, a lot of the time there's a lot of bad faith takes in it, people don't just buy into the narrative. So, let's talk about one specific young adult novel that I grew up with <laughs> and that people, when it took off, people started doing bad faith takes about it. And also why making it into a movie was a bad idea. Um, so the book we're going to talk about, and this is neither in naming and shaming nor elevating and celebrating, it's just a frank and neutral discussion. Twilight by Stephanie Meyer. I know. I'll let you breathe for a second while you think about whether you want to turn off this video. Please don't, because I have a point. Twilight by Stephanie Meyer is a book that was written for lonely young teens. Oh, you lonely teens, young adults, that's what I was trying to say. It's a book that was written for lonely young adults, probably women, but you know, not exclusively so, who didn't have a lot of friends or didn't have the opportunity to be the centre of someone's attention. When I read it as a teenager, as a little non-binary me, imagine this face, but younger, um, <laughs> although I still get mistaken for a 16 year old, so maybe just imagine this face. Um, <laughs> imagine this face, but younger. I read Twilight before it became a sensation. I read Twilight before the second book was, no, the second book was out. I read Twilight before the third book came out. Um, I read Twilight before the second book came out in the UK because I had the American version of the second book. This is a, a repeating story for me, getting American versions of books because they came out sooner than the UK version, so my mum would just order them across, <laughs> across the ocean for me. Um, shipping fees be damned, I guess. I don't know. Um, she's pretty kick-ass as my mum. Anyway, um, so I read the first book, and we're just going to be talking about the first book here. And I loved the first book as a teenager. The idea of being, like, Bella Swan is such a neutral protagonist. She is actively designed for a child or a teenager to imprint themselves onto, to imagine themselves in the position of. And then the whole thing is in a paranormal romance situation. The whole plot of the first book is a paranormal romance which means you have to voluntarily suspend your disbelief to the expectation of a romance novel. I realised I didn't clarify exactly what I meant by suspend your disbelief for a romance, but basically there are conventions and expectations of romance novels that don't match up with what we would want, need or desire in the reality of the situation. In the reality of the situation, somebody coming to your window in the middle of the night to watch you sleep is creepy and stalkerish. But in the context of a romance novel, it is romantic. People tend to have this sort of joke, I hope it's a joke, where they talk about the things in romance novels that are really creepy, objectively, that are presented as romantic. And that is one of the pieces of voluntary suspension of disbelief that you have to do. There is 
pretty much nobody in reality who would want to be treated like the heroine in a romance novel. However, the actuality of reading the romance novel provides you with something that you can't get from reality because of that very fact. And the paranormal thing. And a lot of people weren't willing to do both when Twilight made it big. But when I was a teenager and I was reading it before I ever got discussed for a movie, before the second book had come out in the UK, before the third book had come out anywhere, I loved that first book. Because the idea of being seen for my plain, boring self by some supernatural creature who thought I was the best thing in the whole world and also kind of delicious is really tantalising for a young and lonely teenager. Like, I wasn't a young teenager, it's not... For a, a lonely teenager, it is so tantalising to imagine yourself as the centre, the whole centre of somebody's world, the centre of somebody's fascination, being fully rescued by someone who is completely obsessed with you. That is very much on brand for a lot of teenagers. I'm not saying all teenagers, because I wouldn't ever say that, because again, we are all so individual. But for a lot of teenagers, especially teenagers who read big books, that is a dream. That is something that they can really enjoy. And I did when I was that age. I really enjoyed that idea because I didn't have many, any friends and I didn't have any romantic interests and I was this little unknowingly non-binary teenager, unknowingly well, bisexual teenager, knowing that I didn't fit in with my peers and knowing that part of the reason for that was because I was neurodiverse and not being able to figure out what the other part of the reason was. I was being bullied and I hated it and the idea and that like as a child of divorce the idea of moving in with my dad was quite daunting just because it was, would be different and would require a big massive move because my parents lived four hours away from each other which doesn't sound like a lot if you're in the US or Australia or something but it is a lot if you live in the UK which I did uh, slash do and it was just it was nice to picture myself in that position to be able to imagine myself as Bella Swan especially because Bella Swan again is such a neutral protagonist for you to be able to imprint yourself on, for you to be able to project yourself into. She doesn't make a lot of decisions, she doesn't do a lot of things, and that is on purpose. And when you are the target audience, as I was, except for the fact that I'm not a woman, and also my <laughs> family members, I'm not going to name who did it, but other family members who read the book are varying genders, so people who are now men, people who are now women, um, people who were then boys, people who were then girls, um, they all, the people who, who it was kind of designed for, even if they didn't necessarily fit the gender expectations, enjoyed it as well. But my mum didn't love it because she was an adult and she'd already done the romance thing and it's not for her. It's like, I read a young adult book lately, um, Cinderella is Dead by Caelan Bayron, I say lately, not very lately, but relative lately um, and I could see the value in it but I also had the moment of a lot of moments within it going yeah this isn't for me is it it's not designed for me I'm not really of a demographic that enjoys young adult books anymore which is a bit sad in a lot of ways <laughs> because because it would be nice to be able to enjoy them but I'm just not in the target demographic anymore and that's okay I read adult books <laughs> because I'm an adult and it's okay if you don't want to read adult books if you still enjoy young adult books but you're and you're an adult like there's no problem with that but it's just the the voluntary suspension of disbelief expected for a young adult book is different from an adult book but when Twilight made it big people came in with bad faith criticism people came in not suspending their disbelief actively seeking to pull this book apart because it was a sensation because teenage girls liked it because it was designed for teenage girls and the people on the periphery of what teenage girl is. When adult, particularly men, but when adult critical reviewers came in, they started to tear this book apart. And when it became a movie, it became very, very apparent that Bella Swan had no personality because she was designed for the reader to imprint on and you can't really translate that into a movie. I think ideally what they really should have done in that situation is given Bella Swan a personality, but that's neither here nor there. I didn't like the movie. <laughs> um, 
loved the book, didn't like the movie, loved the book pretty much until, well, I mean, I didn't like the subsequent books so much, but I loved the first book pretty much until I started to date. That was the moment that things shifted for me. My first date mate was a boyfriend and he was great. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't meant to be, uh, didn't work out those kinds of things. But when I started to actually date someone, when I started having actual real lived experience of what it was like to be in a relationship, it I feel so wild to say that it fundamentally changed me as a person, but it did fundamentally change me as a person. I went from enjoying Twilight to not enjoying Twilight because I had this experience of dating. I actually finally knew what I would be like in a relationship. I knew what I would be like if I was dating. And it meant that my, my suspension of disbelief had a limit that it didn't have before because I knew what I was like in a relationship, I knew what I wanted from a relationship, or at least I was figuring it out, I have it down now, I'm married now, um, <laughs> uh, going on for five years of marriage, it's super cool, um, like it'll be five years next year, I'm so excited, it'll be ten years together next year, and then five years of marriage next year, anyway, um, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when it comes to being a person who has dated now, I know what I want, I know what I like, I wrote it into a novel, um, <laughs> the relationship between Mary and Calic is, is like the fantastical version of a relationship that I would want, it is the, like, picking out pieces of relation, the two relationships I've been in, um, and the things that I know that I'm probably never going to experience because it's not really possible, and, and it's so, it's so disparate from what happens in Twilight and it means that as an adult I now have such a different viewpoint on that novel and I don't really enjoy it anymore and that's fine because sometimes we do grow out of books like that's a normal part of of growing up you don't have to act like an adult you don't have to stop enjoying the things that you enjoyed as a child you don't have to stop playing you don't have to stop being creative but sometimes we do grow out of things sometimes we don't love the books we loved as children Sometimes rereading those books is a bad idea because it will forever distort the image we had of it. And like, I know that I'm lucky in that I don't hate <laughs> the books that I loved as a teenager because I can see the value that they provided me when I was a teenager. But I also know the fact that not everybody has that. Not everybody was raised in a way that allows that thought pattern to be processed. Not everybody exists in a way that allows that to be the case. And that's okay too. But a bad faith criticism is still a bad faith criticism and it's still breaking the contract. When you buy, when you buy, when you start reading a book, you're supposed to buy into the concept. You can't go into Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse, for example, and say, well, this doesn't make any sense because, like, let me see, what's on the first few pages that you could not buy into? Um, I mean, straight off the bat, you could just not buy into the, the fantastical universe. What's a guardian anyway? Um, <laughs> page seven, which is basically where the inciting incident starts. Um, and this is all in chapter one. Um, <laughs> and the thing of, are you a sensitive? Why do you need a sensitive? And then the test for sensitive is you could tell me what color this crystal is. And the whole discussion about what is a sensitive and the magic behind it, which is not described in a particular like mammoth amount of detail, but it's enough, it's my flux capacitor as it were. The thing that is early on in the book that tells you this is what you have to buy into, if you don't like it, there's the front cover, close it and go away. Because not every book is for everyone. And but if you were to go into Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse with a a bad faith criticism mentality, you would potentially get to that point and go, well, this is bullshit, isn't it? Because, and like, you might get to the end of the book, you might get to even, not even the end, <laughs> you might get to part way through the book. Um, I wanna say chapter five or seven or somewhere around chapter five to seven and the stuff that happens in those chapters 
you might then go back to the beginning and say, well, this doesn't make any sense anymore because of this fact. And the fact of the matter is, it does still make sense. It is explained further in the course of the novel. But if you're going in with bad faith criticism, you're going to, to want to pull it apart. You're going to intentionally pull it apart straight off the bat, straight from the very, very beginning. You are going to start looking for things to pull apart. And that is a breach of the contract of voluntary suspension of disbelief. So anyway, I hope you found this video entertaining, if not helpful. Um, <laughs> if you want to buy my book, Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse, uh, all the links you need are in the description box below. If you want it to arrive in a timely manner, over the course of December, please, please do think about ordering it if you want a signed copy from me ASAP because I really do need to get it out by tomorrow morning um, and the post office that I go to is only open until 12.30 UK time so you really need to like ideally buy it now. Um, <laughs> this is also the optimum time to get a copy of Mary Allen Breaking the Curse because Mary Allen Finding the Air cover reveal on Tuesday is coming out in March next year. Um, and it, I'm just, I'm so excited about it, I can't even begin. Um, it's, it is, it picks up fairly, fairly immediately after Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse ends um, and deals with kind of the fallout of that novel. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun, a lot of heartbreak. I've made everyone who's read it so far, apart from one who hasn't given me the feedback about whether she cried or not, I've made everyone who read it so far cry, including myself repeatedly. So get ready for some heartbreak um it's it's yeah it's a good one I think <laughs> um so yeah um if you want to find me all over the internet um you can do so all the links you need for me my book and everything else including my coffee account if you feel like spot the channel or in the description box right next to like and subscribe buttons if you feel like sticking around I will see you in two weeks time for my last video of the year and then I will be coming back in January for whatever I'm going to do in January. <laughs> do I have a plan? No. Should I? Yes. <laughs> Bye.